Good afternoon to our viewers in Europe and good morning to our viewers in the United States. I'm Steve Sokol, the president of the American Council on Germany. And on behalf of the ACG and the Hans Seidel Stiftung's Washington office, it's my honor and my pleasure to welcome you to today's discussion about the global financial marketplace as we emerge from the pandemic. As we all know, the coronavirus crisis has led to economic uncertainty. And in an effort to jumpstart their economies, both the European Union and the United States are in the process of adopting ambitious stimulus packages. To talk about the state of the economy in Europe and the United States, we are joined by the chairman of the Hans Seidel Stiftung, Markus Faber. He is a German politician who has been a member of the European Parliament since 1994, representing the European People's Party. Herzlich willkommen, Markus. Also with us is the chairman of the American Council on Germany, John Emerson. He is vice chairman at Capital Group International. Previously, he served as US ambassador to Germany. John just returned to LA from Berlin. So a special thanks to you for getting up early for today's discussion. And to guide us through the conversation today, we're joined by economist Megan Green. She is senior fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School and also the first Dame Anne Julius Senior Fellow in International Economics at Chatham House. You may have seen her commentary in the Financial Times or heard her on media outlets like Bloomberg, NPR, and the BBC. So before I hand over the floor to Megan, let me just remind our viewers that if you have questions, you can submit them using the Q&A function in Zoom. And let me also say that both Christian Forstner from the Hans Seidel Stiftung and I are grateful to all three of you for participating in today's discussion. And with that, Megan, it's over to you. Great, thank you for those introductions and thank you for having us. I'm really excited about the discussion that we'll have. Um, bringing in very different perspectives from the US and Europe. Um, and so I'm gonna kick it off with a question to both of you, Marcus and John, um, because where we sit right now, the US economy is full steam ahead, it seems. We just got an inflation figure out this morning that uh, surprised to the upside, I would say. So there are signs of a hot economy. Uh, most economists think that we might grow between six and 7% this year. And then Europe has recently released some GDP data suggesting that much of Europe is in recession. And so that's kind of where we are right now, but I wanna ask each of you a two-parted question. One is where do you think we go from here in terms of the economy in the US and Europe? Uh, and secondly, you know, it wasn't always that the US economy was hot and Europe was lagging behind. We've had different stages of this crisis where the US and Europe were each poster children at different times for what to and what not to do. And so what are the lessons, the, the top one or two lessons that you think we can learn from the response uh, for the next pandemic, which we all know will come at some point. So I'll, let me kick it off with John first, actually, to discuss where we are with the US economy. Uh, thank you so much, Megan. And uh, uh, Marcus, it's great to be with you as well. Uh, well, you know, you mentioned the numbers. Uh, we are uh, unquestionably, I think, with the combination of uh, our economy beginning to open up uh, as a consequence of the success we've had, uh, or the, the administration certainly has had, in distributing the vaccines and getting vaccinations in people's arms, uh, the economy is going to continue to open up. And then secondly, we have uh, uh, at the beginning of this year, a $1.9 trillion uh, fiscal stimulus. We have the Fed, uh, notwithstanding uh, some of the recent data that shows uh, pretty significant economic growth in the first quarter of this year, plus uh, some uh, in some areas, I said this morning, the consumer price index beginning to inch up, uh, still saying lower for longer on interest rates. And uh, that will continue to assist um, in the economy. And then, we have um, uh, President Biden with his two packages, uh, the jobs package and then the, what they call the family package, which is, um, I think you could call it more uh, soft infrastructure as opposed to hard or traditional infrastructure. 
not sure they're going to get everything through Congress, even with budget reconciliation. I think these will probably have to be skinnied down somewhat even to get it through with 50 votes in the Senate, given the number of, uh, of moderate senators who are, um, would be looking at this. But there will undoubtedly be uh, an additional um, uh, fiscal stimulus coming into the economy, not so much uh, immediately, but I think over the course of the next couple of years, uh, with uh, some modicum of infrastructure spending, my guess is somewhere in the 600 to 800 billion dollar range. So I would say there's a real tailwind uh, for the U.S. economy, uh, really coming through all of 2021 and then moving into uh, <clears throat> moving into t the earlier part of 2022. Uh, of course, this is a political imperative for Joe Biden and the Democrats if they want to avoid the historical. Uh, tendency of the party in power getting whacked uh, two years after a presidential election in midterm elections, uh, and also for uh, President Biden to deliver on what if one of his major campaign promises, which was to try to rebuild the American economy. Regarding your second question in terms of lessons learned, I think pretty, pretty straightforward. Number one, where Germany and Europe was doing great and the U.S. was doing terrible in 2020, trust the science and react and uh, react quickly. Uh, that is a lesson that uh, we failed to follow in 2020, uh, that Europe did and Germany in particular did in 2020. And, and you just saw a dramatic difference uh, in that how phase one and maybe even phase two of COVID uh, uh, you know, developed in the United States and developed in Europe. Lesson number two, uh, don't let up. And, uh, and just because you've done well in the first part uh, doesn't mean you don't need to also drive hard on the second part, which uh, in this case is once we have the vaccinations, investing the time and money and effort in the logistical challenge of getting those jabs into people's arms. And that's a place where, uh, uh, where the United States this year has done an extraordinarily uh, effective job and where Europe has been a laggard. And I, I'm sure Marcus has some thoughts on, on how and why that happened, but let me just stop there. Great, thank you, Marcus. Can we hear your outlook for Europe and some lessons? Yeah, thank you very much, Megan. Uh, before answering your broad uh, uh, <laughs> range of questions, I really want to thank the American Council on Germany and especially Ambassador Emerson and of course, Dr. Sokol for the good cooperation we have as Hans Seidel Foundation with you, but now I leave my hat uh, as president of Hans Seidel Foundation, and now I'm the member of European Parliament who serves in the Economic and Monetary Affairs Committee as the spokesman for the largest group, the EPP group. And uh, uh, I think number one is, of course, uh, we have to improve now the vaccinations in Europe. We are behind the United States, but actual figures show that per capita, we do more vaccinations in Europe than the US does, but you have already more than 50%. We are around about one third. So I think um, the promise that till uh, the day of French Revolution uh, that was announced by Commissioner Breton, the 14th of July, so 10 days after your Independence Day, we will have the rate of 70% vaccinated. And uh, we are on a right, on a good way to achieve that. It took a while, and honestly, one of the reasons is, of course, I'm in Brussels at the moment in Belgium. Pfizer has a huge uh, production capacity, which was not only uh, uh, making the vaccination for Europe, but for the rest of the world, except Russia, United States, China, and some others. Uh, and, and therefore, uh, that is, of course, one issue. If you ask me lessons learned, um, we will improve the capacity of production. Uh, of vaccinations as we have invented. The number one comes from Germany, from a small startup, uh, BioNTech, which does not have the capacity to produce for billions of people in the world, uh, but we are improving that at the moment. So I think if you take lesson number one, we have to be more independent from other sources in this area, as uh, our estimation is we will have uh, annually uh, doing vaccinations to the people. Number two, if you look to the United States, uh, to the 50 states, <laughs> you have good ones and not so good ones. And I think that is the same we have in Europe. We have member states who suffer a lot 
especially in the area of tourism. Uh, we have uh, more than five member states where more than 20% of GDP comes directly from tourism. Even in my constituency, which is in the center of Bavaria, I have more than 20% coming from tourism, but we've been able to manage that last year with inside Germany tourism. Yeah, so normally the Germans leave the country in summertime and others are welcomed. Now we used our facilities by ourselves, but that will not work in Greece or in Portugal or in Spain or in, in, in Malta or, or in Cyprus, you can imagine even south of Italy to mention the most dependent member states uh, on tourism. But we think with these vaccination rates till uh, mid of July, we will be able to improve that. On the other hand, why not US being the, the steam machine, <laughs> which uh, is carrying the others with us for the moment? If I look especially to German economy, it's only China who is the steam engine uh, where we profit a lot uh, and to have more shoulders where growth can be established makes me quite optimistic. Honestly, um, we learned a lot a year ago when we had really a shutdown, a lockdown, even on border lines. Number one, the virus does not stop on borders. <laughs> Number two, if you can't stop the, uh, the virus, you shouldn't stop uh, the workflow. <laughs> and, and therefore we improved a lot of our systems in that sense. So I think uh, that is one of the lessons learned. And you have to be aware, of course, we are looking to the huge programs uh, Joe Biden has announced and John said already some things about that. And then our European program, Next Generation EU, looks like a, a small one, but it's only the, the topping, <laughs> yeah? the cream on the ice ball, uh, which is uh, the recovery package as a lot of, of national uh, uh, stimulus packages have been addressed by all member states of the European Union and we are only the cream above that what we do via Europe. And then last, of course, we have to take into account um, Germany will have elections in autumn, which is a challenge for Europe. France will have presidential and parliamentary elections May, June next year, May presidential, June parliamentary elections. And that is a challenge as well as inside Europe, the French-German cooperation is the steam engine politically and economically. So of course, everyone is waiting what's, what will be the outcome in Germany. I don't have a crystal ball telling me anything about that at the moment, uh, as the issues I think at the moment are discussed in the public will not be the issues in September when we have the elections and the same goes for France. No one knows what will be the core issues uh, in, in May, June next year. But there are the main challenges for us ahead. Uh, how this European Union will look like after these two very important elections. Yeah, great. Let me pick up on a point that you both mentioned. You both highlighted the sheer scale of the fiscal stimulus in the US. And Marcus, you mentioned that the EU's package, the recovery fund or next generation EU looks quite a bit smaller. And I just wanted to pick your brain a little bit on some of the details of that. So, you know, it is smaller. It's also not ratified everywhere. Um, and the EU hasn't managed to actually borrow money on the markets. Um, so I wanted to ask you kind of what you think the timetable for all of this will be. Um, will it be ratified? Will Romania scupper that? When will countries actually receive this money? And then when they receive it, will they be able to absorb it? Because some of the weakest countries in Europe, Greece, for example, couldn't absorb 6.5 billion, but now all of a sudden it will absorb twice that. What, what do you think the outlook for that is? Is that a problem or is, is that a red herring? No, the problem is, Megan, you are too good informed about our internal problems. <laughs> I thought I could hide them uh, inside Europe, but honestly, yes, that are the big problems. Number one, European Union has only a budget which is 1% of the GDP of the European Union. So it's a small budget. Germany has, without social insurances, around about 40% of GDP in the public budgets. And, and that goes for the average for all member states in the European Union. So the financial power, the fiscal power lays in the hands of the member states, not on, the, on union level. On the other hand, we doubled that now from 1% to 2% to create this program Next Generation EU, which is uh, a huge progress. But as the member states stay for the debts, 
all of them have to ratify this uh, increase to 2%. Um, that's the own resources decision for those who really know Europe uh, in detail. And that has to be done unanimously in all member states, mostly with support of all national parliaments. So in Germany, we needed both chambers, Bundestag and Bundesrat to ratify that. We got it, we even got a court case uh, because of that, uh, but we overcame that as well. So we are on a good track. Some member states have not yet ratified, but it was clear that we will not have it before end of June. And that is my estimation till now that end of June, all member states have ratified and then commission can go to the financial markets as uh, we will have uh, first time a huge amount of uh, government bond from the European Union. We see a huge appetite in the financial markets all over the world. So we think there will be no problem to get investors. Um, let's see one issue. Then, of course, we will uh, donate the member states with a first injection that uh, they really can start. Uh, 100 billion should be this first injection directly in, before summer break. And then, of course, we have the absorption problem. Yeah, uh, Normally, we say in Europe, maximum 4% of GDP can be absorbed by aid from the European Union. Now, if you look to the figures, you mentioned Greece, if you look to Italy, to Spain, we are around about 20% of GDP uh, in stimulation. Uh, that's, that's a huge amount on the one hand. On the other hand, uh, member states really did a lot of efforts uh, to be able to use this money in a proper way. It should be, or it can only be used for investments, not for ongoing uh, costs or not for the social system. Uh, as it is named next generation EU, the next generation should have the benefits and not only the debts. And uh, therefore it's a huge investment program. And I think that will really stimulate in making our economy more green, in introducing digitalization in a lot of areas where we don't have, in improving our healthcare system, to mention the three big issues uh, which have to be done. And therefore, I'm quite optimistic that uh, member states will be able to absorb the money in a proper way. Yeah, okay, great. Um, now I've picked some holes in the EU's fiscal stimulus. John, I wanna um, kind of stress test our fiscal stimulus in the US with you. Um, you've highlighted the sheer size, it could be up to you know, six trillion in total, including the ARP. Um, and I wanna ask you about the political feasibility of that to some degree. So actually some of my European colleagues have said, we don't know if we can trust this because what if uh, the Democrats lose the White House? Will it all be reversed before the medium and long-term effects of things like infrastructure spending actually kick in? Um, and also Biden has said he won't deficit spend. Um, will that necessarily cap the amount that they can do? And will that have political implications as well? So what are the chances that this turkey can fly? Uh, well, it, it may not look like a turkey, but I think it's going to fly. Uh, it, and by the way, let me just say, Marcus mentioned the BioNTech uh, Pfizer relationship, probably no better example of, of the power of the transatlantic relationship than um, the success yeah. uh, with that vaccine, both in terms of developing it with the mRNA, uh, and I visited BioNTech when I was ambassador, uh, and the distribution, uh, you know, uh, capabilities of Pfizer. So I just wanted to give a shout out there. Um, great question, Megan. And here's my here's my take on it. Um, first of all, in terms of whatever is passed through Congress, however it is passed, being undone, if say, you know, uh, Joe Biden doesn't get reelected in 2024, or even if uh, the Democrats no longer control Congress after the midterm elections, it's not going to happen. I'll give you, I'll tell you what, a simple example that proves the point. M not one single Republican voted for the $1.9 trillion uh, COVID relief package that was passed a couple of months ago. It was all done on the budget reconciliation process. Yet lots of news reports that as these members of Congress are going home to their districts, they're taking credit for it, okay? So you're not about to see, particularly if a member of Congress didn't have to pay a political price uh, for voting for more spending 
uh, they're, they're certainly not going to go to their district and go, yeah, you know, that bridge that's being built and those jobs that are being created in our district, I'm going to take those back from you now. So that won't happen. The question is, uh, and you've raised two elements of it, what does ultimately get through Congress? And, uh, uh, you know, there are, um, it, 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 the two elements are, number one, uh, what can be done uh, in a with traditional legislation, which requires 60 votes in the Senate to break the filibuster. Uh, and short of that, what can be done with the use of the reconciliation process, which only requires 50 votes in the Senate. And, uh, and then the second piece is this whole question of uh, Joe Biden. And let me also say uh, Senator Joe Manchin, uh, who I will describe a little bit more fully in just a second. Um, uh, has also said he doesn't want to see more deficit spending and wants to see some of this paid for. So to cut to the chase, uh, I don't see uh, the uh, Democratic uh, Democrats in Congress or the administration being able to get 60 votes in the Senate for anything that has a substantial tax hike as part of that particular package. There is some Republican support for closing loopholes on corporate America, for instance, that allow multinational corporations to move assets and money around and therefore avoid or reduce the tax burden to the United States. There's, you can get bipartisan consensus on that. But everybody who's in the Senate and the House on the Republican side three years ago voted for the Trump tax cuts, which brought the corporate uh, tax down to 21 percent. They're not about to turn around and vote to, uh, you know, shoot it back up a few points. So the answer to the first question is, and we will know a lot more by the end of this week, because I think it's even today uh, that the president is meeting with this bipartisan group of senators to see if some agreement can be reached on. And now they're they've raised the Republicans have actually raised it from 600 billion to they're willing to go as high as 800 billion dollars, which is about a little less than half of what Biden has asked for in his jobs plan of infrastructure spending of the nature that it, it, most people would think of as infrastructure, you know, bricks and mortar stuff for bridges, roads, uh, buildings, airport expansions, light rail systems, and broadband, and particularly broadband in rural America, which is a big need and which also might help you get some red state votes. So uh, we're going to have an answer to that piece. My guess is if they split it up in two, there will not be much more than loophole closing in terms of the tax portion of that package. So then the rest of what President Biden wants would have to be done through the budget reconciliation process. And there are two elements of taxes there. One, uh, he has proposed as part of the job, jobs package to raise the corporate tax up to 28%. It was at 35%. Trump brought it down to 21%. We're now talking about bringing it up to 28%. And uh, remember, in the budget reconciliation process, you have to get all 50 Democratic senators to say yes. So every senator walks into his caucus or her caucus on the Democratic Party wearing a suicide belt. You know, they could just pull that trigger and blow the whole thing up. So Joe Manchin and Kristen Sinema, who I've actually spoken with uh, in person about this, uh, both represent... Um, purple states, and in, in, in uh, Manchin's case, it's a ruby red state, really, West Virginia. And they both said they're not more com comfortable with going higher than 25% on the corporate tax. Well, what that tells me is there's no way on God's green earth you're going to see a 28% corporate tax get through this Congress under any set of circumstances. So, so maybe in that reconciliation piece, you get some pay-fors uh, with a slight increase uh, in the corporate tax. And let me just say, during the Trump tax cut, Corporate America would have been thrilled and had ticker tape parades if they saw the taxes come from 35% to 25%. But that's not necessarily going to be a, you know, an economy killing uh, move there. The second piece is more of this philosophical argument that uh, would, would, number one, pay for the more, what I guess you could, you could say, or you know, Biden is calling it an, a one-time capital investment in, in the American citizens. Uh, the Republicans are calling it a you know, liberal wish list, uh, but essentially it's more social programs on things like child care, family and medical leave, uh, two years of free preschool, two years of free community college. Those kinds of things are part of the second $2 trillion in the, in the Biden infrastructure he calls the American Families Act. 
um, that is going to be paid for by taxing the rich. And the rich are very narrowly defined as 0.03% of the population. Essentially, everyone who has more than earns more than $400,000 a year uh, sees their taxes go up. And everyone who earns over a million dollars a year sees their taxes go up a lot. And, uh, and, and the first part of that would be to uh, just basically restore the highest income tax rate that existed uh, under President Bush and President Obama until the Trump tax cut, which it basically kicks the rate up to 39.6% from the existing 37%. The second piece though is interesting. It is to treat capital gains for everyone who makes over a million dollars a year at the same rate as ordinary income. So in other words, the philosophical idea that, that is suggested by this is that earnings on capital investment should be taxed at the same rate as earnings on wages to sort of equalize the higher end of uh, income earners with working people. And, uh, and so this is very important uh, to President Biden, not just to generate you know, money for paying for all these programs, but also, uh, you know, to uh, deal with, to address a, a problem that even at Davos in 2020, which happened just before the shutdown, uh, the World Economic Forum, there is widespread agreement that there is a problem with the widening gap between uh, the top end of society and, and, and working people. So, um, so it's not even just, are we, we got to pay for this, it's sort of how do we pay for this? And my guess is you, you already have seen some members of the Senate, and remember, 50 votes in the Senate, you got to get all of them. Some of the Democratic senators have said, you know what, doubling the capital gains tax, even for those high income earners, is too much. It may impede growth, uh, what have you. But I, I, I see it as highly likely that the, the tax rate tables will go up for wealthy Americans and there will be some increase in the capital gains tax. I just don't know how much. So my guess is at the end of the day, you'll have some of this paid for, not all of it, and you'll have a slightly smaller package, maybe significantly smaller package than what the president has proposed because those seven or eight purple state democratic senators uh, are, uh, are, are concerned with doing too much uh, at this point in time. I hope that was, wasn't too long-winded. No, that was fantastic and comprehensive on a really naughty issue. So thank you. And I, I agree with everything that you've said. I wanna get Marcus's take on all of this, particularly the social welfare side of what Bidenomics is trying to achieve. I wrote a column in the FT last week saying that Bidenomics was absolutely revolutionary. And a French policymaker uh, came back and said, I, you know, this is basically just the US adopting the European social welfare model. There's nothing new here. And so I'm curious what your perspective on that is, Marcus. Is this really new or is the US just catching up with Europe? In which case, you know, there are a lot of Americans on the right side of the political spectrum who are really concerned that we're doing too much. Um, so where will the U.S. stand relative to Europe on the social welfare model if, if this is yeah, the, Oh, Megan, that is really a difficult question because even inside Europe, we do not have a social model. We have minimum five different models, which we have in competition, which I think is a good idea because it keeps those systems effective. If you look at the welfare system in Scandinavian countries or the really social market economy in Germany, the, uh, how to translate the French state behavior, uh, everything is pub service public, everything is done by state-owned companies, more than 50% of the GDP in France is done by state-owned companies. It's a fully different model, model for creating stability and social, uh, especially social stability. And uh, in the South uh, of Europe, we have don't want to blame anyone, but more this traditional model, the state guarantees only a minimum and the rest has to be done by the family and relatives around that. So there's not the European model. Of course, in Europe, everyone has a healthcare insurance <laughs> to, to mention one issue. Uh, however, it is financed in the different models, but everyone has that. Everyone has the right of a pension scheme. Everyone in, in, in Europe uh, has the right uh, for protection in unemployment. And therefore we have 
good macroeconomic stabilizers, for example, which really functioned now as well as 10 years ago. And uh, so therefore we could provide a kind of social security, which is the European standard, but that are things we are used to. That are things which are well established on the other hand, if you speak about financial markets, you are well established. We don't have the systems. And, and, and uh, though therefore it's not to look what is Europe good doing and that could be a blueprint for United States or vice versa. We are different economies. We have different approach. You have a lot of responsibility on, on state level, not on uh, uh, federal level. Uh, we as well, especially in the social system, and therefore, um, everyone has to find its way. But if you ask me as a European, I think those three fundamental questions should be a minimum social uh, um, environment for anyone to have help if you are ill, to have help if you are in un unemployed, and to have help uh, for, for retirement or a retirement scheme, which uh, gives you pride in, uh, after your working period. So therefore, if you translate that as the European model, yes, there is a European model. We are now discussing a European minimum wage, for example, where I'm not so convinced as if we look inside Europe, uh, the highest minimum wage we have in Luxembourg. I know only the Euro figures, please uh, convert it by yourself to do US dollars. Uh, it's 14.5 uh, euros an hour in Luxembourg. And in Bulgaria, we have the lowest one, which is uh, around about one euro per hour. So uh, to make a European standardized minimum wage will make no sense, for example. Only to translate it, uh, um, what are the main challenges if you look inside the European social model. But on the other hand, especially uh, when you look on these macroeconomic stabilizers, unemployment and short-term work schemes, they've worked properly uh, now during the crisis. We improved them 10 years ago or 12 years ago in the economical crisis. And they are now standard all over Europe and they really brought stability, especially in those areas where we have a lockdown. If I look out of my window here, my office in Brussels, since Saturday, restaurants are open only outside. Mm -hmm. So half a year, everything was closed down, not only in Belgium, but in most of the countries of European Union, and not to bring all these people to unemployment, uh, but to protect them with these, uh, especially short-term work schemes, is one of the great benefits we have established in Europe over the last years. So if that is something uh, US is going to adapt, I have no problems, but honestly, I will not give advice what, what United States have to do as our economies are really different. You have more mobility of workers, we don't have that. Yeah, uh, I remember when I was 15, only to tell you one story of my life, when I was 15, I visited Chicago and that was in the 80s. So it was a booming area, yeah? the car center, the steel center of the United States. But I learned that later people left uh, this, uh, Detroit, sorry, Detroit. Uh, uh, they left it and, and went to California. And one told me once, wow, uh, it's quite the similar whether I construct a car or a computer, at the end you have to adjust the screws. So <laughs> this kind of mobility we don't have. Unemployed people from Greece will never go to the Netherlands. Uh, so uh, if you take that into account, we have some disadvantages in our, in, in our economy, which you don't have. And therefore you can't compare everything. But uh, for us, uh, honestly, as Europeans, uh, in, in the social area, uh, we are more with uh, Joe Biden than uh, with Mr. Trump and the taxation, we are more with Mr. Trump than with Mr. Biden. And, uh, but that is the European point of view. Yeah, interesting. Thank you. Um, John, I wanna ask you about the elephant in the room from an economics perspective. Um, there's a huge spat in the economics profession right now about Bidenomics and whether we're going to overheat the economy and generate significant inflation which would push the Fed to hike rates and pitch us all into recession. Um, and my boss at Harvard, Larry Summers, is a proponent of this argument. And then there's the Biden administration and the Fed who are saying, eh, don't worry about it. Uh, it'll probably be fine. And I'm curious kind of where you fall on this question and at what level, if we end up deficit spending a bit and driving up our debt even further, 
when does that become a problem for the U.S.? The perennial question, but it, an important one now. Well, I, actually, I think the audience would be more interested in hearing your thoughts on that than my thoughts. And, and in particular, if you take my uh, uh, bait and, and uh, uh, on this at all, uh, in particular, just this sort of paradox of, uh, of people wanting to hire folks, but uh, jobs not being filled that we saw in the latest unemployment report. I'd love your thoughts on that as well. Uh, look, I, I am not an economist. I do sometimes play one on TV, but I am... Uh, I'm not an economist, um, uh, but I would say uh, I, I would say this. Um, I think that uh, I, I sort of fall somewhere in between uh, the summer school, and I wouldn't even say the Biden folks. I'd say the MMT theorists, the you know modern monetary theory, which holds uh, you know advising people like Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren that holds it well as long as. Um, you can control interest rates through the Fed. And as long as you print your own money, knock yourself out, you know, spend, 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 it really doesn't matter. So not sure I buy into that. Uh, but um, uh, I think that we've got a long enough way to go. And inflation has for so long been under, you know, even the modest target that the Fed has uh, set uh, for inflation, including before, you know, we had this uh you know, policy induced government shutdown. Remember, the shutdown wasn't because some bubble exploded, like in the global financial crisis. It was a public policy decision made uh, to try to get on top of this uh, global health pandemic that we were facing. And so uh, I, I think in, in light of, uh, of both of those, uh, that uh, I, I, we, we certainly can handle more fiscal stimulus. I don't pretend to have the information that Chairman Powell has. Uh, but, you know, even a month ago, he was uh, preaching, we need to do more from a stimulus standpoint. Uh, and, um, you know, God, God, you know, forbid me to, you know, contradict uh, my former White House colleague from the Clinton days, uh, Larry Summers. But, uh, uh, but I, I, my, my instinct is that uh, and, and my sense of reading it is that uh, we can continue to do more uh, and that another, you know, trillion dollars on top of what's already been spent or even trillion and a half if, if, if you know, uh, Biden gets closer to even half of what he's asking for, uh, that our economy will certainly be able to absorb. Beyond that, we need the capital investment. Uh, I thought it was quite interesting that, um, I, I mean, from a, not, not from an immediate standpoint, but from a medium and long-term standpoint, I thought it was very interesting that the way President Biden pitched uh, this uh, investment, the Families Act and the, the Jobs Act, was these are investments that are needed, capital investments that are needed for us to ultimately be competitive with China. And uh, if you look at what China's spending, in terms of developing its technological capabilities, in terms of uh, you know educating its uh, its people, particularly in the STEM areas, uh, in terms of uh, building geopolitical, I'd say transactional rather than values based relationships with countries around the world, including some even in the EU, through One Belt One Road, uh, which essentially allows China to put, you know. It's, it's hands around the throats of some of these countries where if the debt doesn't get serviced, they can come in and control these new assets that they're, you know, building, uh, you know, that uh, we are woefully behind. And so this is not, you know, just a simple economic issue. Are we going to overheat the economy? It's a question of, of a, you know, taking advantage of this opportunity uh, with which we have been presented as a result of a policy induced economic shutdown that we need to try to recover from to make longer term capital investments in green technology and education training, educating uh, the entire workforce uh, so that, um, uh, that we can in fact uh, be more competitive with China. I'll give you an example. I find it just stunning that when we go to Europe and say, hey, there are a whole lot of intelligence reasons why you should not be using Huawei to build out your 5G systems. We can't then turn around and say, so here's an alternative that's just as cost effective and in fact, uh, maybe even better, given our leadership 
in the area of technology over the last 30 years, it's just stunning to me that we don't have that. And from a trans putting the transatlantic hat back on my head, I can't imagine that there aren't some investments that can be made across the Atlantic, particularly when you look at the BioNTech Pfizer success in building out a, a 5G or the next, maybe it's 6G, you know, the next generation. So um, I am much less worried about just the short-term overheating the economy effect. I'm much more worried from a geopolitical standpoint in our failing to take advantage of this opportunity to make these long-term investments that are truly necessary. Yeah. Yeah, so the risk of doing too little is way bigger than- Exactly, the, uh, thanks, that's a much better way to put it. Well, no, <laughs> I'm just summarizing what um, some of what you said. Um, Marcus, I'm curious, uh, so there's also talk about inflation accelerating in the Eurozone. Um, and so I'm curious what the European perspective is on all this. Are you looking at what's going on in the US and thinking this might be something that we should follow? Let's see how it plays out in the US or is the European perspective that this is all gonna end in tears and we should stick with what kind of orthodox economics has always told us? Yeah, thanks, Megan. Uh, honestly, I tried to avoid the failure which uh, your finance minister, Ms. Challen, did <laughs> with a lot of destruction of the uh, uh, share markets. But, but honestly, of course, uh, we will see rising inflation in Europe as well. For the moment, the calculations are that is due to these uh, base effects, as we had really price uh, going down, we had reduction of VAT, for example, in Germany uh, for half a year. That, of course, creates these base effects, which we are figuring out at the moment. But if we look what's happening in the especially commodity area, only to mention copper and, and lumber rising sharply. So the construction sector has uh, huge problems at the moment. We have problems in the automotive sector uh, with uh, chips, microelectronics, and, and therefore um, all of this creates increasing prices and, and it can be an additional driver beyond this uh, public debts uh, for, for inflation. And my concern is, which I call uh, the ketchup effect. Yeah, <laughs> you know this uh, experience, you have a ketchup bottle, you want to get something out of it, nothing appears and then you <laughs> give it a kick and you have all of that on your plate. Uh, I, I learned to, to manage that for catch-up, uh, but for inflation, we are not yet experienced. And honestly, as, as money is um, very cheap, so the German finance minister gets money for nothing. Yeah, it's a great song, but uh, <laughs> money for nothing, it has no price. Money has no price at the moment as uh, we have negative interest rates for 10 years government bonds in Germany. So we are the lucky ones, uh, but even for Italy, France, uh, very low interest rates. So money is cheap. And that, of course, creates an environment. If something has no price, you can spend it how much you want. And that is my catch-up problem, that maybe once you kick too much, you will have a really rising inflation rate. And then, of course, that will uh, tremendously hurt uh, growth. Uh, uh, all over Europe, uh, because then the uh, European Central Bank has to put uh, higher interest rates against that. And that, of course, uh, will make money very expensive, very quickly. And that will not even hurt the financial sector, but could hurt the, the economy uh, tremendously as well. Though, therefore, we have to be aware of that. For the moment, our famous stability and growth pact, uh, pact is suspended. So no one takes care of the new debts. You know, we have these limits of 3% new debts a year in comparison to GDP. Uh, for the moment, it is suspended till the end of next year. For me, it's a little bit too long. I come back to my catch-up effect <laughs> uh, because no one knows what's happening uh, in this time till end of this year was acceptable for me according to the figures I had available. Uh, but to in, uh, prolong it even now for the next year. And we got a discussion now originated by Italy, by France. Oh, is it really a need for this stability and growth pack? Is it too harsh? Uh, look, nothing happens in the inflation environment. Whatever member states are spending, whatever Europe is spending. So why the hell do we need these uh, limitations? 
that is a really dangerous uh, discussion we have at the moment in, 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 in Europe as and that is the main difference to the United States. The macroeconomic instruments are not on federal level. They are on member states level in your uh, world, it would be the states, yeah. not the federal government. So in our world, the macroeconomic tools, fiscal tools, social systems, the macro, main of uh, macroeconomic tools are in the hand of the member states and not of the European Union. And that of course is the danger because one can hurt the other. And that is what we learned 12 years ago when Greece went more or less bankrupt, uh, the financial markets tested <laughs> Is Europe and the Eurozone ready to protect this country or not? And, and checked whether we are able to protect Greece, Portugal, Spain, even Italy. And uh, we did it. Yeah, whatever it takes. You know the famous words from Mario Draghi. And the financial markets accepted this uh, bazooka, as Draghi called it uh, himself, uh, this whatever it takes. Uh, uh, but that could be uh, a problem again for the moment. It's not a problem. Even Greece, even Italy, Spain, Portugal can borrow for low interest rates money in the financial world or the financial markets. But that was in 2008 the same. And in 2009, it stopped for some member states and markets said you are not able to repay any, anymore. So uh, we increase the interest rates. We want to have a security uh, interest rate and, and, and money was very expensive for those member states. So there is a concern that inflation can go up. For the moment, the figures show only these base effects. We have not yet seen how these increasing commodity prices are taking influence on the inflation rate as it is really a limited number of, of commodities. Uh, but uh, that, of course, will have a huge impact as the construction sector is one of the most important sectors in all member states of the European Union. And if we have higher prices there and uh, construction comes to a stop or uh, goes down, uh, will hurt uh, employment rates uh, really hard. And therefore, we have to be aware of that. Yeah, can I can I just double check something with you? Um, because you could be worried about Europe uh, in light of the sovereign debt crisis we had a decade ago, um, either because of the debt side or because of the growth side. So you could be worried because all these European countries have amassed huge amounts of debt and right now borrowing costs are pretty low, but if there is inflation and the ECB hikes rates, then borrowing costs will go up. And so that could create a new debt crisis potentially, or you could be worried because growth has been really low and maybe the next generation EU package isn't huge. Countries seem to only want the, the grants piece, not the loans piece. And so you could, uh, you could be worried about either side. And it sounds like you're worried about the first one. I'm worried, I'm wondering, I'm much more worried about the second actually. So I'm curious whether you're also worried about the second, and if so, and there could be a problem down the line, this is a huge question that I'm gonna ask you to answer as succinctly as possible, since we're gonna start running out of time. I know, but it's what a very important question. What do you do about question. it, or the Eurozone do about it, it, in order to address it proactively, knowing something might be coming down the line? Yeah, Megan, the problem is you are really too good informed about what's happening in Europe. And honestly, we have both problems, and it belongs on which member state we are speaking. I see that we will have tremendous growth rates in Greece, in Spain, even in Portugal. But we learned as well that after the recovery in 2011, Italy and France had no piece of the growth cake uh, from, from the world economy. Uh, they had really a problem. And that's why we as parliament uh, said very clearly for this next generation EU program, if you want to have money out of this program, reforms have to take place because we have to overcome this slow grow rate, especially in Italy in, and France. And we learned those member states who had to do reforms because of Troika, you know, all these things we have established 12 years ago, will more participate now from this coming out of uh, the pandemic uh, economic problems. And those who never did any reforms will have huge problems. And therefore, uh, um, if you ask me, we have some member states where I have concerns about number one, as the total uh, deficit of Greece is still very high. 
And uh, if you follow IMF advice, it's too high. If you look to Italy and France, the growth rate is too low and even the expectation for next years are very low. So they have to do something to participate better from the recovery of the whole world economy uh, and, and therefore reforms are necessary. Germany will be the, the steam engine inside Europe and Eurozone. And uh, as I said, we are linked to the steam engines in China and in the United States. And I will not add anything what John has said already about these problems, but we will have to find answers on this question as well, which steam engine is in the long run, the most stable one, China or the United States. I have an opinion in my mind, but uh, for the moment, German economy especially uh, puts everything on China. Yeah, I'm going to make a really unfair point that you can't respond to, but it's worth remembering because I often forget that Germany just barely skated past recession before the virus hit. So Germany as the growth engine of Europe um, might, might be slightly alarming. I, I want to switch gears to John, um, though, because John, you've brought up kind of geopolitical tensions and also the transatlantic relationship a number of times. And a number of Europeans have said to me, isn't Joe Biden's Buy America strategy basically just the same as the Trump's Make America Great Again strategy with cuddlier language? And so I'm kind of curious what you think about that and what, it, and what the implications are specifically for the transatlantic relationship and trade between the EU and the U.S. Uh, sure, that's a great question. And uh, but, but before I go there, I just want to say, take the ketchup analogy and just say, of course, we all know that the way you truly deal with the ketchup is you take a knife and you put it up the ketchup thing uh, and, you yeah, yeah. It and it goes. And that's Tell the, role the of central the bankers. That's <laughs> yes, the role nice. of the Fed. And and <laughs> Janet Yellen got herself a little bit in trouble by basically making that point the other day that you know if inflation gets low there they can just a little bit of a nudge in interest rates and be like getting that knife in the ketchup bottle mm -hmm. um well look i've been saying i do a lot of these uh both for uh, capital group uh company i work for and and acg and other organizations and i've been saying for well over a year uh that uh while the biden approach to foreign policy will be dramatic departure from the Trump approach, which really wasn't, didn't um, uh, emphasize the importance of our alliances, our multilateral organizations that were built in the wake of the Second World War uh, and all that, uh, to, uh, that would be different. But that when it comes to trade and when it comes to China, the Biden approach will be much more different in, as a matter of degree rather than a difference in kind from the Trump approach. And the reason for that is that the politics in our country of both trade and in particular dealing with China have dramatically changed over uh, the last say five or six years. And this was um, something that preceded uh, Donald Trump. Now, don't forget when it comes to trade, uh, I ran the effort in the White House in the Clinton years to get the Uruguay round of the GATT through Congress, which created the WTO, and also to get China most favored nation trading status through in 1996. Probably it was before China's accession of the WTO. And we had to do that every year, which actually gave us a little bit more leverage uh, on China at that point. Uh, and in both cases, I believe Nancy Pelosi led the floor fight against Democratic President Bill Clinton's efforts to get these things done. So don't forget the Democratic Party has historically been very, very skeptical about trade. This is one of the reasons Bernie Sanders almost beat Hillary Clinton in the 2016 uh, Democratic primaries. He was hitting very, very hard on trade because the concern, of course, was that with these, you know, multiple trade deals, you're going to have job loss, a hollowing out of the middle class. And the uh, at, at the same time, the increase in pros economic prosperity, productivity, reduced cost of goods that free trade would create. Uh, would not be sufficient to offset that. And in point of fact, I think we've seen in our country that that actually is accurate, that the, you know, the, in effect, the hauling, hollowing out of the manufacturing base of the United States did occur. I blame technology and automation more than trade, but trade's an easy you know, uh, finger to point at in terms of that. So, uh, so the fact that Joe Biden, and, and by the way, the change in the last four years 
was not so much in the Democratic Party position on this, even though, and, and if you think about it, Barack Obama and Bill Clinton, who embraced uh, these major trade deals, were a little bit outliers from the uh, Democratic Party. Uh, Bill, uh, J- um, uh, Barack Obama only got 29 Democratic votes in the House of Representatives to get uh, the fast track approval, the uh, Trade Promotion Authority, they now, now call it, to negotiate the TTIP and the TPP uh, trade agreements, which tells you where trade was in terms of the Democratic Party. The shift was in the Republican Party in that you had Donald Trump taking much more of a protectionist uh, argument and, and in effect going after the traditionalists like the Bush family and the Republican Party, just as Bernie Sanders went after the Clinton family in the Democratic primary in 2016. And he really has transformed the Republican Party's view on trade towards much more of a protectionist type of view. I will tell you, even when I was involved in the TTIP negotiations, and even back then, the, the European, we had a lot of issues on agriculture, and Europe is incredibly protectionist, particularly your home state, my friend, uh, Marcus Ferber. Uh, <laughs> no, it's wrong. It's always wrong. When it comes to American <laughs> agriculture. Yeah, exactly. When it comes to American agriculture. But uh, Europe's uh, frustration in the United States was on all the Buy America provisions that weren't necessarily federally mandated, but certainly were in states and localities. And so, you know, you're right, uh, Megan. I mean, uh, we're, with Joe Biden coming in, we're not seeing uh, these dramatic shifts in trade. So far, not one of the tariffs that the Trump administration imposed against China has been taken down. And while there has been some flexibility shown in terms of the Boeing Airbus fight, uh, the, the steel and aluminum tariffs, for instance, that, that include Europe, that really were targeted much more towards uh, China, those haven't come down either uh, because I think American steel manufacturers kind of like them. And so, uh, and the steel union kind of, steel workers union kind of likes it. But don't forget in terms of difference in degree, definitely a tonal difference. And Tony Blinken, the new secretary of state in a speech to the US Chamber of Commerce a couple of months before the election did say one of the administration's first steps would be to uh, to eliminate the, quote, artificial trade war with Europe, end quote. Uh, but I do think a lot of Europeans are sort of sitting there waiting to see, okay, well, what does that mean? So I would just caution the listeners not to expect a 180 on trade uh, coming out of this administration or honestly coming out of a future Republican administration. I think that the entire dynamic within the United States is, uh, is somewhat different on that. The difference is this. The, uh, I mean, another difference is this. Rather than pulling out of the WTO, which would have been the Trump approach, the Biden approach is to stay engaged and work with our allies to reform the WTO, increase its the enforcement mechanisms, particularly vis-a-vis unfair trade practices that China and others may be uh, conducting. Uh, so that, so that, I mean, that's a significant difference. But you know, we're not getting rid of Buy America, that's for sure. Yeah, so tactics are different, but for an actual company wondering how the environment has changed, it, they might not be feeling it. Well, create jobs in the United States like Siemens has done. Siemens has 60,000 workers in the United States. They've been quite successfully, another Bavarian company, Marcus. You are always invited to invest in Quite Europe successfully. Well. Especially in Bavaria. <laughs> on our light rail systems, but because they make them in the United States. So that's what I would encourage all these German companies to do. <laughs> yeah, but you are welcome as well with your companies in Germany, <laughs> and especially in Bavaria, of course. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much to both of you. This has been an absolute masterclass. Um, we're out of time, so I'm going to kick it back over to Stephen. Megan, you, you said it. This has been fantastic. I want to really just thank you for this rich and incredibly nuanced discussion about the U.S. and European economies I think that if we had had more time, we could have dug even deeper, but you gave us an incredible snapshot of where we are and where we're going in the weeks and months ahead. Megan, thank you for masterfully guiding today's conversation. You did an outstanding job. And Marcus and John, you know, thank you for your frank and open insights. Uh, you really drilled down on a number of complex issues, and I think we all learned something from this. So on behalf of both the ACG and the Hans Seidel Stiftung, I just want to thank all three of you for making the time for this interesting and important and timely conversation 
Of course, thank you to our viewers for tuning in. And it's always wonderful to partner with the Hans Seidel Stiftung. So thanks to everybody who was involved in, in putting this together, but really the big thanks goes to the three of you. So thank you. And I hope to see you all again soon, perhaps this fall, even in person.